Good morning. Welcome out to St. Clair Baptist Church. We're certainly glad to uh, be together this morning. And if you're joining with us on social media, uh, likewise, and uh, very appreciative of your attendance and also the outlets we have to be able to share our fellowship with whoever. And we appreciate Villa doing that always. Uh, and if you're visiting with us today, it's uh, wonderful to have you. Appreciate our Sunday school teachers this morning. Uh, that were able to bring us the uh, study, and we'd like to encourage everybody that can to come out for our Sunday school. Uh, I've got some announcements I wanted to go through. Uh, I've got, um, this is a new one here. Janet had announced it um, Wednesday night. So at Sedine uh, Bible Camp this week, they're going to have uh, a conference, and it's a national conference, and it's going to be, um, the title of it is Hope for Israel, and it's going to be Monday at 7 p.m., and then on Tuesday through Friday, it's at 10 a.m., 1.30 p.m., and 7 p.m. And if you're not familiar with Sedine, it's, uh, it's been there many, many years, and it's out this road. Uh, just keep driving uh, way out there, and the address is 333 Sedine Camp Road. So uh, if you want to plug that in, that'll get you there. So um, anyway, appreciate Janet, and I'd like to encourage everybody that can. I actually talked to a, uh, a pastor, a local pastor that's going to be out there some this week. I was talking about that this week. So. Uh, and some uh, several other announcements. Of course, our tonight service is at 6 o'clock, Wednesday night Bible study at 7. And we'll have our uh, men's prayer breakfast, breakfast coming up this coming Saturday morning. Uh, the cooking will start at 7, and then the eating and fellowship uh, start at 8 a.m. Uh, also remembering that, uh, let's see, May the 29th, in lieu of our evening services, We'll be having a cookout at Spring City Nature Park. Uh, stay tuned for details on that. And then Vacation Bible School coming up June the 6th through the 10th. And also, um, any updates on that, Barbara? Anything we need? Just to still got the sign-up sheet in the foyer. Still got the sign-up sheet and we'll put everybody to work. <laughs> we did have some details I wrote down. So it's, it, daily it will start at 5.30. Uh, and, and that'll be the uh, dinner session. And that'll conclude at 6. And then... The classes and everything else will be six to eight, so it's a little bit, little bit different time this year. So it's really a good time, and that was part of the uh, meeting that they were able to have last Sunday when they worked out some of the details for vacation Bible schools. So there's still plenty of room to be used and uh, make yourself available there and be praying about how God would use you with that. We need some people on recreation. Recreation, that'd be fun. What's the theme again? Spark Studio. Spark Studio. Uh -huh. Boy, if those sparklers oh, weren't. We're yeah. Okay. So be thinking on that. That'll that'll get some people for recreation. We need uh, all kind of people for recreation, right? <laughs> First aid and <laughs> people with whistles and referee uniforms too. So about anything you can think of. I've got a I got a card I wanted to read. It says church family. We would like to thank you uh, for your love and care shown through emails, texts, and phone calls. It has been a blessing being part of this family, Jerry and Janet Branson. And we feel likewise, so thank you for the car. All right, do we have any other announcements at this time? All right, seeing none, I'll ask if anybody had a birthday this past week. You know, if I heard somebody had one, no? What about anniversary? No anniversaries? All right, nothing, nothing happened this past week for... Any kind of celebration except all these graduations going on for sure. And we're thankful for those. All right, I'd like to invite our scripture readers up at this time. Psalms 118.8 It is better to trust in the Lord than to pick confidence in man. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Acts 17, 30 and 31. Truly, these, these times of ignorance of God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all, raising him from the dead. Amen. Uh, 
That one went well with our Sunday school lesson this morning, didn't it, Brother Harold? So I appreciate, appreciate the Bible verses. Anybody else? That one's fun. All right. Let's look at our prayer requests, and I'll, uh, I'll read through those at this time. We've got down uh, Cody Isham, Thelma Wood, Hunter Hendricks, Tommy Stennett, Chester Ezell, Connor Roy, Brother Harold's Uncle Tommy, Tina Peak, Sue Smith, Joshua and Caleb, Mary Knopf's grandparents, Jim Newby, Cleet Vest, uh, Missionaries and Persecuted Christians, Stephen Leonard Newby, Janet Branscombe, Andrew Theobald, Erlene's granddaughters, Robert Lynn Smith, Shanta Clark, Nolan Cantrell, Kathy Kaywood, Kathy Thompson, Heath Latshaw, Denise Latshaw, Buddy Carraway, Eva Dunnigan, Grady Sue Parker, Vicki Bunch, uh, Mickey, and also his mom, his sister, and his grandson, Latell Cunningham, Melissa's his dad and mom, Dwayne Geno's daughter, Dicey's daughter April, uh, Mandy's friend who has cancer, Jennifer Tollett, Candy Latshaw's mom, Beth Cheryl's dad, Hazel Henry, Mary Hill, Stanley Cunningham, Harold Goins, the Williams family, Gail Garrison's neighbor, Kurt's friend Rudy, Monty Terry, Marilyn Davis and son, Rod Killian, Liam Holland, Jamie and Brian Killian, Leonard Waldo, Paul Bartley, Fred Locke, Pearl Lane and Kay Willis, a baby Miles Warfield, uh, Sedine with her hosting of the Hope of Israel conference, Debbie Burkhart, Melissa's uncle Eddie Butler, Donna Barry Reed, uh, Mary Rowden, who uh, now um, continue prayers for her and also specifically for a fracture in her back. Kurt and Lisa Smith, Stan Bias, Sarah Francis Newby, David Edwards, Dallas Reed, uh, rehab and also his caregivers and his daughters who are traveling to facilitate that. Uh, Larry Reed uh, for, with Parkinson and also for his salvation. Owen Ray, praise and prayer, Ukraine. Uh, Emma Erickson and her mom, Dicey's co-worker's daughter. Callie Jolly, Vacation Bible School. And then I've got a doctor appointment this week. All right, we'd like to add to our list or update at this time. We have Jamie and Brian Children are back feeling good. That's great. All right. Praise for them. Uh, so my, my dad, he uh, last Saturday had another stroke, and uh, plus his blood was really low, and he spent a week in the hospital, but he got to get out Friday evening. And, uh, thankfully, the stroke wasn't a, a bad one and didn't affect uh, nothing but his vision. Home and feeling better. Amen. 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 You got a good report too on this colonoscopy and stuff too. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Yeah. All right. What else? That's all good. A lot better. All right. So all right. Cool. All it's, it's good to see you, Robert Lynn. Yeah. Look, look great and, and glad to be with you and uh, <clears throat> thankful for the praises. Bill? On TMP. I told her we would specifically pray with her about her kidney function. The doctors have told her she's really close to being failure and having to go on dialysis. So she's real concerned about that. And rightfully so. I told her to pray. We will certainly be praying for Tina for that. And my brother in law, Justin Thiring, is in the ICU this morning, but he's doing better. His blood sugar is soared up in the 500s, and he was having a lot of problems. Yesterday, but he's doing better this morning. All right, remember, Justin. Mike, we got a thank you card that says, Thank you all for the beautiful flowers. We appreciate greatly your prayers. Thanks. Thank you again. Love the Clarence Smith family. All right. All right, thank you, Dan. Okay, anything else? Thank you. 
What was the name again? Okay. Harley Bowles family. All right. Thank you, Stella. Right. Anything else? Uh, Prayers for Roxanne and Charlie getting here safely, and we pray also for uh, travel mercies as they head back Tuesday. Yeah, it's good to have y'all with us this morning. Lisa had a great big smile when she announced y'all were coming in. So, yeah, she still got it. And despite how long y'all been together, not fighting like siblings or anything. So that's awesome. Know that you're loved, because I see it in Lisa's face every time she mentions y'all's name. <laughs> All right, anything else? All right, Stella, would you open us in prayer this morning, please? Still, right?
was great because with my hearing aid turned all the way up, I still got the, it keeps me kind of checked. I can't sing much anymore. So that's why I get over here real close to it. <laughs>
I'm glad David clarified that because I thought after Ray had said he appreciated us because we drowned him out, I thought you were really stepping up this morning, Dave, <laughs> going to drown Ray out there. So let us know otherwise. Shouldn't jump to conclusions, I guess, right? <laughs> Does anybody have a song for us this morning? All right. thankful that you do that. So, anybody else have a song for us this morning? I mean, Melissa might request to cook up or something, but as far as singing, we don't get it. <laughs> All right, come sing for us, Jane.
man and wife asleep in bed. She hears her a noise and turns her head. He's gone. I wish we'd all been ready. Two men walking up a hill. One disappears and one left standing still. I wish we'd all been ready. There's no time to change your mind. The sun has come and you've been left behind. Life was filled with guns and boys, and everyone got trampled on the floor. I wish we'd all been ready. Children died, the days grew cold, a piece of bread could buy a bag of Oh, I wish we'd all been ready. There's no time to change your mind. How could you have been so born? The father spoke, the demons died. The son has come, and you've been left behind. sad story for those that are not Christians, but as Christians we have the promise of eternity in heaven and as Stella prayed this morning if you're here today and doesn't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, let that day be today and as Janet's reminded us in song uh, as well so Brother Jim, I'd invite you up at this time As always, it's good to see you this morning. Good for us as believers to be together in God's house when His family comes together. You know, as we look at our scripture and we read and study, sometimes it's difficult for us to understand portions of it, what's happening, why it's like it is, what God tells us. So I want to just think, I've been looking at this for... Uh, while in thinking about it and wants to think when our prayers seem unanswered. You ever been there? Mike this morning read a long prayer list. Every week we have a number on that. But if you remember many times names on there a short time later we're remembering families. Why does not God always answer the prayers as we pray them? I think all of us find ourselves in that at some point. Uh, we're going to look in a few minutes at the fourth chapter of John, the encounter of the nobleman with Jesus. I was in Gaza. That Sunday morning, we went to the only Baptist church that's in Gaza. Several million people live in that area of the Palestinians. I think there was either one or two other churches in that whole area. There were about probably 20 uh, Christians that morning at church. I sat down by a young man. He was probably in his 40s. And uh, as we began to talk, he told me he'd been educated at LSU. He had his degree from there. And while he was there, he became a Christian. He accepted the Lord as his Savior. And as he talked, he kept on. He said... I have tried every way in the world to get a visa to go back to study to get any way to get out of here. And he said, I'm a captive in a hostile land. And he said, I know that in a few months or years that more than likely if I stay here that my life will be over because there will come a time when they wipe out the Christians here in Gaza. He said, can you possibly help me get out of here? Is there any way? And I had to explain to him, hey, we just we were lucky to get in where we are. Uh, we have no connections with anybody. It was just the fact that they allowed us to come in for a short time. 
And I said, but we'll pray that for some way you can get out. And he said, I've prayed that prayer for a long time now. Probably, it was not more than a few months later, the word came. They had virtually wiped out the Christians in that area. And I imagine he was one of those that they took out. He prayed. Here was a handful of Christians planted in a place where the, the message was not going through. And yet, they were taken out. Why does it seem that those prayers were answered? You ever find yourself in those circumstances? You're praying for someone. You're praying for something in your own life. Something different. And you say, God, right now, can you possibly help me? And we pray diligently. And after a time, it seems that we don't hear an answer. Or maybe that God says no. What, what's going on? What's happening? The scripture this morning that comes out of that fourth chapter of John. You know, it's, it's interesting. You think, well now, is this a prayer? Is it not a prayer? When God walked among us alive, was it not a prayer when they talked to Him? They asked Him for things? It's a prayer just like we do. Praying to the same one we pray to in what we do. In the scripture, beginning of that fourth chapter, the 46th verse, says, So Jesus came again in the Cana of Galilee, where he made the water and the wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. This was about 18 miles away from where Jesus was at this time. When he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. And then said Jesus unto him, Except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. And the nobleman said unto him, Sir, come down, ere my child die. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and went his way. And as he was going down, he met his servant. And he told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Then inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. And so the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus had said unto him, Thy son liveth, and himself believeth, and he and his whole house. The story of the nobleman. A few couple of chapters earlier, we find that Jesus doing his first miracle as he turned the water into wine. And then the people saw him. They began to talk about what was going on. He goes on to Jerusalem. Uh, he sees the woman at the well. A lot of events have taken place. But now he's coming back towards home. There's a government official. A government official that really is in need. His son's critically ill. And being a, he actually served the king there, was a part of that. He had access to the medical people of that time. And surely he carried his son to see them. And they had tried to work on him and nothing seemed to happen. And so, most likely one day, somebody mentioned to him, have you ever tried the prophet? There's a prophet named Jesus that we're hearing a lot of things about. He's able to do miracles. He's able to change things. He most likely can heal your son. And he said, they told him, said, and knowing who you are with your pull and with your rank within the king, he'd come to you. He'd go home with you. And so... He goes out to look for Jesus. He knew one thing. He knew that nothing else was going to happen. Everything else seemed gone. And he said, I'll do 
what I feel like is the last hope I have. Have you ever been there? you ever gone and said, Lord, I really need your help. I've done all that I can do to help myself. Most of us get at that point at times. We get to the point that something's happened and uh, gone on around us and we've tried our best to fix it. And all of a sudden we realize, hey, I can't fix this. This is out of my control. It's nothing that I can do. And so then we say, Jesus, I've got a mess. Can you help me? A father, no matter what his rank or whatever his position is, becomes desperate when his son approaches death. When he sees there's no help, and he begins to think to himself, if I can find him, surely, surely he'll help me. I'll go and ask him. Critical need develops in our lives. Something that we find we can't handle. And finally, we realize, hey, it's time to place it in God's hands. We find there's a motivation. A motivation in that there's nothing that we can do. And so, we finally begin to sincerely pray. You know, we pray a lot. We're involved a lot. But how many times are we sincerely praying? And how many times are we just talking to God? There's a big difference. A big difference in how we approach Him and what we do and what's going on. What are we looking for when we ask Him? Are we really saying, God, this is what I sincerely need or do we stop and think, God, will this glorify you? You remember one of the things that we are told so much and reminded of to pray, God, if th is this your will? We want to be in His will. If we are not in the will of God, then does He listen to us? When the Father approached Jesus, He told Him what He was saying. He said, Jesus, can you come go with me to my house? I want my son to live. I want him to live. I want him to be well. He is going to not survive if you don't come. Go to my house with him, me. It was an intense, sincere request. And it seems a little strange the way that Jesus answers him. But remember what he told him? He said, are you here because you believe or do you want to see a miracle? What he was saying is, if I answer this prayer for you, what difference is it going to make for you and your kingdom? What difference are you going to make if you do this? What's going to happen? So, Let's look. Let's see what comes next in this prayer time as we look at it. The second thing that we're reminded of is what, ans what happens when the answer is slow or not what we expected. Have you ever prayed for something and the answer not be anything like what you thought it was going to be? Sometimes it's better. Sometimes it doesn't seem to fit what you asked for. Sometimes you say, God, is that really an answer to what I've asked you? Is that really the difference that's going to be made? <clears throat> Jesus looks at him and again he says, Jesus, you've got to go to my house. And he says to him, go thy way, which is, I'm not going to your house, but your son's going to live. Go home. Can you imagine what that daddy was thinking? Has that occurred? It says that he accepted and he believed. But I can imagine that most likely he was thinking, if he'd gone with me, I can be assured of that. 
But right now, I'm going to go see. But I really wonder if all of this is going to take place that he, that he has said. So he turns and he starts going home. What happens when we pray and God's prayer is slow? I was on church staff in Brandon, Mississippi. We had been there about three and a half years. The pastor that we went there and worked with had left. We had a new pastor. He came in. He was excited. He was telling us all he was going to do. Two weeks later, he had a massive heart attack. We were playing volleyball. Let me tell you, when you get old, don't play volleyball. It is not a good sport. When you're young, it may be all right. But I told him when he started out that night, I said, you need to be careful. And he said, I'm not old. I'm only 44. I can't even remember when I was 44. But he got out there and he started playing. And he went over to, and sat down. And uh, I walked across to him because I could tell, looking at his uh, complexion change and all, that he was pretty sick. And I said, we need to run you on out. And he said, oh, I'm okay. I said, get in the truck. I said, you're not the boss right now. We are. We carried him out. And, of course, they discovered immediately he had a major heart attack. Uh, a few days later, I was with him when the doctor came to see him and told him, said, you've lost 40% of your heart. You'll never be able to do the things you've done before. And it crushed him, but he said, told me, he said, I will, I'll be well. The church, at the next day after he had his heart attack, uh, we had a prayer time for him. Several hundred people gathered and they prayed earnestly for his health, for him to be able at that time to survive and for him to be able to return and do the things that he wanted to do. A very active pastor. But you know, it was three years before his health returned. He went through trying to get back and he didn't listen to what the doctor had told him. He jumped back into things, and the next thing he was going through severe depression. He actually had to take retirement, a medical retirement, and go home and try to recuperate. It was a slow process. But you know, God answered that prayer. He recovered to the point that he was able to pastor, he was able to do mission work again and go and do but it didn't happen the way he wanted it to. What happens when prayer is slow? What happens when God says, wait? Wait and see what will happen. See the difference that I will make. You've been listening uh, to David Jeremiah lately. You hear He's preaching on Elijah. And as I was working on this message, I was thinking about Elijah. You know, Elijah... He had his ups and downs in his walk with the Lord. He had prayed and he had seen the, that on Mount Carmel. He, he had seen the God intervene and God's power come down. And, uh, he, everything went his way. And then as he got off the mountain and as he was leaving and the rain was coming, he had called it for to come back. He got the message. There was a woman by the name of Jezebel. He should have known when he heard that name there was something wrong. She said, Elijah, what you have done to my prophets, I'm going to do to you. In other words, I'm going to have your head as soon as I get to you. And what did he do? What any brave man would do when a woman was after him? He ran as hard as he could run. Did he talk to God? He talked to God, I'm sure, all the way, saying, God, what in the world is going on? He got to the point, he said, I'm all alone. I'm the only one left that even believes in you. That wasn't true. God counteracted and told him the truth. But what he was saying is, God, why have you not answered my prayer the way I prayed it? Why have you not done it? the way I ask it to, do, to be. 
one of the most difficult things for us as believers to understand is prayer is not magic. It's not a magic thing that we say, well, God, I'll just ask you. It'll happen just like that. There's no problem about that. <coughs> what prayer is, is faith and acceptance of God's will. It's not saying, Lord, I prayed last night. Is my answer here yet? It's saying, God, I prayed. I prayed in faith. God, I'll accept your will. And I walk in what you've called me to do. We've seen miracle prayers take place. We've seen great things happen around us in our church. But we've also seen the, seen the time when God said no. Sometimes that's the way it happens. When Jesus tells him he's not going, he begs him until Jesus tells him his son is okay. I can imagine that he was thinking, you know, if I go home with this prophet with me, look at how they're going to look at me. They're going to say, he's got a lot more power and influence than I ever thought of. He's brought the prophet home with him. Jesus knew his thoughts. And he said, go home. It's taken care of. He asked him, do you just want to see a miracle? And then I think what Jesus was saying to him was this. Can you trust me to do it my way? Can you trust me to do it the way that I'm going to do it? As God himself. I'm going to take care of it. Go home and see. He's saying to him, he says to us at times, my plans and your plans are not the same. It's difficult to listen and hear that. But we have to realize that God is reaching out to us. He's going to take care of us, but his plans may be totally different. And as we sometimes see, we may not understand his plans until we're in heaven and he answers us there. He shows us the big picture of what's taking place. Something that was going on that day as he was dealing with this man. He had a group of disciples. Disciples who were trying to decipher who Jesus was and what he was doing. He was doing disciple training. He still does it with us. We were in Mississippi, 2005. You know, I forget a lot of dates. I never forget August 29, 2005. I was standing in the, uh, I guess it was the day before the 28th. I was in uh, the uh, emergency management center. We were standing there watching the, on the screen all that was taking place by a little storm that was out in the Gulf, a little storm called Katrina. I watched it hit Category 5. I had worked probably 50 to 75 hurricanes across the years and watched them. I had not seen one like this. I was uh, standing there talking to a good friend of mine who was, uh, he was the weather forecaster for the Hurricane Center. Uh, Jake Butch and we were talking about it and he said we've never seen anything like this he said we're seeing buoys in the Gulf with waves 75 and 80 feet tall can you imagine a wave 80 foot tall going taller than this building as it when it came across he said people cannot realize what is going to happen you know, we did some hard praying the next, that day and the next, saying, Lord, if, if it's within your will, weaken the storm. Lord, 
if somebody must have it, give it to Louisiana. Give it to Alabama. Don't give it to us. You know what? It came straight in. God said, no. Wait and see what's going to take place. He said, this will touch lost people who would never have heard or listened to the word of Jesus if this had not come. It was amazing. It was amazing to watch people. People that could care less about church when everything around them is gone. They listen. They hear. They listen to what you have to say. He was doing faith training. To us, to a lot of us that were involved in that. He was doing as he did Paul when Paul went to him and said, Lord, I have this thorn. Can you take it away? And God said, Paul, you can live with it. You can live with it. And you can make a difference. Just live out your faith in what you do. What a difference it makes. Sometimes God says no. But when He says no, He's also helping us understand there's a reason for that answer. There's a reason for it. And just look and see what difference it makes when those things happen, when those things come. Some years, many years ago, I heard a parable, a story, about a man that one day he was uh, there having a regular day, and God spoke to him and said, I have a message for you. This is your last day on earth. Live it well. Live it well. As all any of us would if we had that word. And, uh, I've been with a couple that have been told that. He said, I'm going to do what I think I need to do. He said, you know, it's two or three people I've had a grudge against for years. I'm going to go make amends with them today. I'm going to tell them I'm sorry, even though it may not have been my fault. And I'm going to talk to them, and we're going to talk together, and we're going to pray together. And we're going to make up for all those times we lost. Then he said, I've got two friends, lost friends, I needed to witness to, and I put it off, and I haven't taken time to get by and see them. Today's going to be the day. I'm going to share with him. And he went by and talked with him. He thought for a moment, he said, you know, I've been saving up my money to buy some special things. But, you know, I'm not going to need it now. But I know some people that really are hurting that do. And I'm going to give it to them and take care of them. And then he said, you know, I've got some older friends that really need somebody to come in and care about them and love them. And he went and said, I'll use the last of my time to show true friendship and show true love. And then he went home. He knelt to pray and said, Lord, it's the end of the day. I'm ready. I've spent my last day with you doing what I thought you would want me to do. And the Lord spoke back, said, you know, now you're too valuable for me to take away. Live on. Live on in the spirit of what you've done today. 
because today you've been like Jesus. One thing we can be assured of about prayer, God answers prayer. He's going to take care of it. He may answer it in the way you ask it. He may ask, answer it in a way that you see it work out. Or may, He may answer it in a way that you really don't understand what He's done. But He's going to answer it in such a way if we look at it, if we try to understand it, He will teach us how to walk with Him and how to understand an answer. It was at the Last Supper. <clears throat> Jesus was talking to the disciples. He was telling them, He said, you know, I'm fixing to leave you. And they were getting upset. And they were trying to ask questions. And He gave them one word of advice. He said, pray. Pray that you will not fail in what's about to happen. Pray that you will not fail. We know that they went out to the garden and that Jesus prayed. And when He came back, they were asleep two or three times. And He said, can you not watch with me? And can you imagine what He was saying? Can you not pray right now? Guys, you're going to mess up if you don't pray and see what's going to take place. But you know, what they were supposed to be praying for didn't happen. They all became afraid. They all ran. They left Jesus aside. All of them deserted Him. But you know, as they came back and began to realize what had taken place, that prayer, the way that it was answered to them, turned them in to disciples that could have lived for Jesus. If they had not missed the whole point of the prayer that Jesus told them to pray, they probably never would have been the disciples that they could be because they realized in not listening that time what they had missed. And they were term determined never to miss his answer again. Are we that way sometimes? God answers prayers in mysterious ways. Sometimes unbelievably for the good. Sometimes unbelievably because we don't understand the answer. But God answers prayers because He loves us. He keeps us in His hands and He's going to walk with us. So what I would Close this morning with this. Yes. Remember what he said about the mustard seed? If you have that faith, if you pray with the faith of the mustard seed, you'll understand the full power of God's answers and what he wants you to do. Let's pray. Father, so many times, we come to you praying, Lord, help us right now. Lord, we've got ourselves in another mess. Can you help us get out of it? And Father, you with patience and love, you reach to us and you answer our prayers. Father, you answer prayers about health and about life and all the things we face. And sometimes we understand and and sometimes we don't. But Father, we know that you are answering them. We know you love us. And we know you keep us in your hands. And so Father, I would ask this morning, help us to fully understand the power of prayer and how to approach you. To come asking within your will. To come asking within your way. And come asking that it be something that glorify you by the way we're able to live with your answers. Father, bless us this morning during our time of invitation. 
Father, we ask this morning, if there's anyone that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, that open their hearts to you today. And Father, help us as we walk into our world today to make a difference by the way we live. Bless our time together, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand for our invitation.